Gabrielle, who's going to kick us off. Gabrielle. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be presenting ideas related to a hub um, on behalf of my group. And the ideas center on understanding temporal and spatial dynamics of hazards and interactions with coastal human natural built systems for resiliency. A main objective of the hub would be to, would be to develop a module based integrated modeling framework that can lead to a better understanding of the temporal and spatial evolution of coastal hazards, allow an assessment of impacts on human natural built systems, predict decision making and migration patterns and devise effective management solutions. This module based integrated model would provide an understanding of the signals of impending hazard impacts of the hazard and longer term impacts and alterations to ecosystems and communities informed by surveys of people's decision making in coastal areas building regulations and codes policies and community level information such as health and hazard exposures and the potential solutions to mitigate impacts simulation models in each areas for example hydrology human behavior, pollutant transport, the performance of the built environment, exposure risks, must be based on observations and are becoming more mature and advances in computational science allow for greater resolution of the hazards and associated impacts. However, the integration of these simulations is lacking and would be a major focus of this hub along with finding potential solutions. Simulations could be scenario-based for better understanding and planning but also have a real-time component that can inform communities more directly. Engagement with stakeholders, stakeholders is essential and necessary to provide input on needs and priorities and to understand how stakeholder participation will be encouraged and facilitated. The hub should integrate ongoing efforts of other agencies to ensure that activities are greater than the sum of the parts. Joint support for postdocs and graduate students is one way to accomplish this. Having a modulated integrated framework that contains modeling, data collection, and solution development that will help communities and scientists have a better understanding of resiliency is essential. It will allow tackling challenges at the intersection of knowledge domains and develop multifaceted solutions that cut across those domains. Simulation models in each of the focus areas, for example, hydrology, human behavior, pollutant transport, et cetera, must be based on observations and are becoming more mature and advances in computational sciences allow for greater res resolution of the hazards and associated impacts. And we now need to understand the depth and breadth of the knowledge gaps at the intersection of knowledge domains related to coastal resilience and the aim of the hub would be to address those issues. Thank you so much for your attention um, and I'm done.
Okay. Um, so am I actually, what's happening? Yep, you're good to go as soon as you're ready. Uh, uh, more time to review what I was going to say. Am I actually, what's happening? Yep, you're good to go as soon as you're ready. Um, all right. Okay. All right. Um, Michael, do you have the live stream running? Because I think you're getting a bit of a loop there. Um, you might want to just mute your, uh, if you mute your sound, then uh, we should be okay. Okay. Um, is that better? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Good. You can you can hear me. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, but if you have your sound turned up, then you'll just hear yourself coming back. So turn off your sound and, and off you go. Okay, so you can still hear me with my uh, speakers turned off. Yep. Uh, I can't hear you to know whether or not you can hear me. Um, all right, I'm going to just go ahead then. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so we're group three, and what we're um, interested in is, is how the uh, sedimentary, biological, um, human, water environments um, interact during uh, climate change that... Um, We'll have this as sea level rise changes and um, climate changes. Um, the earth is not a static uh, situation uh, that you cannot just raise sea level and keep the same, um, the same environment. But in fact, the, the shoreline moves and changes shape. Uh, the plants respond, the uh, ecosystems change, uh, people change their environment. Um, there is subsidence. Um, underneath the land that changes the changes the rivers as we have, have seen change the amount of water and sediment they're bringing down and so um, given that there's this um, complex interdynamic um, response to changes in sea level and storms how do we um, understand and predict what is going to happen under the uh, under the longer term I think within that, we have to integrate not just the natural sciences. Um, so, yeah, the, the natural sciences, including, you know, I've listed some of the things of, of trying to understand um, how the, the sediments and water and, and biology moves around, but we also need to include the humanities and social sciences um, and how um, historical records and how people change and react. Uh, economic data, because um, depending on how land and real estate values change, um, people are going to react differently to, as the changes take place. And we need to obviously incorporate the, uh, the stakeholders and the managers who are involved with this because they're going to make the final decisions um, as to how to react to the changing um, natural environment. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we can't just go on taking, um, you know, for future planning, for instance, if you put on a storm and just raise sea level without changing the bathymetry is not adequate. If you take a look um, in, the, in the picture, the, uh, that land as sea level rises is not going to remain static. Those houses are going to fall into the sea and the cliff is going to retreat. Um, so we need to incorporate um, how the landscape is going to change into how we um, project the, uh, the, the future in order to 
get a better assessment of, of the risks and hazards and how to create a resilient coast in the face of the fact that the, that the dynamics are, are, are changing. And we need to then involve the, the community planners to, um, in this in terms of that, you know, as the landscape is, is changing, the, the responses have to be based not on what the current static situation is, but how the environment is, is changing. It'll also be able to improve modeling of uh, storms and episodic events because you're not using the present day to try to look at the impact of future events. Um, and finally, I'd like to say that, you know, right now there are a lot of disciplines that are already doing a lot of components of this kind of modeling. Um, there are some pictures up in the uh, upper left showing both observations and, and, and models, not of the same place. Um, but we need to integrate the models across different uh, disciplines and, and couple them in order to get a better understanding of what will, will happen. We need the hubs to drive this convergence, um, bringing lots of different kinds of, of, of data and synthesis and data collection to go with the modeling um, in order to get a comprehensive view. And of course, we have to involve the stakeholders because nothing is going to change unless the community is involved in what we're doing. Thank you. Fabulous, thanks Michael. If you wanna leave the breakout room there. Hello all, my name is Nirni Kumar. I'm a faculty at University of Washington. And what I'm pitching over here is a research network within the umbrella of coasts and people focused on crusher exchange mechanisms with implications for larvae, contaminants, water quality, and public health. So this is an aerial imagery. This is from Southern California, but really it could have been from anywhere in the coastal US where you have pollutant sediment laden plume, coming in into the coast and then going into deeper waters. And what I am trying to pitch over here is a research need to understand this crusher exchange process. This is completely wrapped under a hypothesis-based basic research kind of environment which NSF has always been fostering. So the science questions which someone can ask within this kind of framework would be, what are the physical and biological processes-based exchange in different environments? And what are the implications for water quality? The approach over here would be uh, to use data collection, which would be a combination of uh, physical, biological, and socioeconomic data. In addition, uh, development of biophysical and socioeconomic models, and then identify community-based response and decision-making, which would then go to water quality issues. So the recommendation over here is not to design a hub, but design a research network within a hub to investigate coastal material exchange. This could become a part of a hub, like fundamental research in coastal regions, which was pitched in the Atlanta Cope, or it could be one of the hublets for the thematic hublet model, which was pitched in Chicago. Uh, the basic science question which this research network would address is the relative role of physical and biological processes, which are occurring between the shoreline and the coastal waters and then evaluate regional variability in the coastal US and then relate it to population connectivity. Plus, applied questions, which would then relate to exchange dynamics, which lead to changing water quality along the shoreline, identify how the knowledge of water dilution helps ecologists and beach managers perceive beach safety. And then finally, uh, how do uh, social economists or social scientists figure out what is the implication for the economy as beach closures happen. The project relevance is obvious. More than 50% of US population lives along the coast. And most of these coastal regions are vulnerable to anthropogenic activities, 
urban and agricultural runoff along with stormwater discharge contribute to nutrient, microbial, and chemical pol pollution along the coastal US. The degraded water quality is often leading to infectious and gastrointestinal diseases, beach closures, and economic loss. The idea which we are pitching over here through this network is a research nexus and a focus group, which is very well integrated within the COPE program where physicists, social scientists, and biologists can interact together to tackle this problem of pressure exchange and its socioeconomic impact. And it is very well integrated within the growing convergence research, which is one of the NSF 10 big ideas. Obviously, there is an iteration with the stakeholders over here, which could be coastal or beach managers, regional sea grant managers, lifeguard organizations, um, and it could also be uh, already existing channels like NOAA, USGS, and National Asian Research Reserve, where NSF can pass on this information to them. Finally, the reasoning or supportive evidence is, is a lot over here. Here are some pictures to give you an idea. There is raw sewage coming out into the ocean, and then images of um, where you have signs which says stay out of water to avoid contaminated water to so that you don't get sick. And then you, on a larger scale, you have dead zones in Gulf of Mexico because of nutrient pollution coming into the water. All of these are some things which can be addressed using crusher exchange. And the core program is already doing some of this. There are people who have worked together, biologists and physicists, who are measuring data together. We need to be able to create the success story in other regional US locations, and then also involve the social scientists and economists while we are collecting these data sets. And that's it. Okay, and away we go. Good afternoon. This presentation is discussing a decision-centric approach to coastlines and people. The presentation has been co-designed by myself, Klaus Keller, as well as... Mary Albert. Our main idea is to provide a deployable and nimble framework for integrated and iterative adaptation planning. It starts with stakeholder values and decision analysis that help to define the research needs that are problem specific or area specific. Some examples me might be how is development shaped by repeated extreme events or how will future tropical cyclones impact the area? It's driven by the questions in the region. Our research produces mission relevant insights that provide knowledge and understanding of the remaining uncertainties. This decision or support helps a diverse set of stakeholders and decision makers to identify robust and resilient strategies for adaptation. Of these strategies, what are feasible and preferred? We go back to the stakeholders again in an iterative process. This then brings us to the recommendations. First, to be specific, pick a region, and then to establish an intellectual hub with spokes, and to use this hub with spokes to integrate the relevant academic disciplines, stakeholders, and decision makers into an environment of shared discovery. We then use this to leverage existing networks and projects and focus on identifying an achievable and sustainable path towards implementation. Last but not least, it's important to provide required time scale and resources to allow for sustained stakeholder relationships and successful iterations. Our idea pr produces key impacts. This decision centric approach can identify new, exciting and decision relevant questions for the research. It helps to integrate across a diverse set of academic disciplines, stakeholders and decision makers. It is problem driven. It provides generalizable insights and tools that could be used elsewhere. Last but not least, it improves real-world decisions that can provide considerable benefits, whether they be environmental, economic, societal, health, security, you name it. Our take-home message is simple. The decision-centric approach combines well-tested components, is scalable, and can help to meet the urgent needs of coastal populations.
Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Olga Wilhelmi, I'm at MCAR, and on behalf of our interdisciplinary team, um, I will be talking about our idea about multiple hazards and cascading impacts. Um, in a nutshell, we are proposing a hub that would focus on co-produced interdisciplinary science of understanding, predicting, preparing for, communicating, and responding to co-occurring or sequential coastal hazards and cascading impacts. Um, this hub will um, include a foundation uh, that has strong engagement uh, with communities and stakeholders. It will conduct interdisciplinary research on the interactions among different systems and disciplines. And it will have an infrastructure to facilitate interdisciplinary coastal research and uh, uh, capacity building at the local level. Uh, specifically, we are recommending to focus on the um, processes in relationships among different coastal hazards across different uh, spatial and temporal scales in a larger context of environmental, social, technical, and informational uh, system while engaging uh, stakeholders. To do this work, we need to uh, develop new observational and um, analytical methods for both data collection and multidimensional risk assessments and also develop uh, co-develop tools to evaluate alternative strategies to reduce the risk, uh, communicate risk to the community, and also share knowledge broadly within the community and uh, stakeholders. And to do this work, we also propose to have a strong computational uh, big data infrastructure support uh, to um, sustain and support these activities. Um, this research, uh, we have addressed the compounding effects that are likely to increase with changing climate, uh, demographic land use, and climate change. So this is an important er uh, area of research. Uh, we also recognize that some of the values from this work could be uh, generating new and transferable knowledge on coastal processes and hazards that could go beyond the geography of the hub. The data sharing framework that we're proposing could assist both in empirical research and model development, as well as assist with operational work of hazard preparedness and response. And long term, it could lead to uh, community resilience. And by engaging multiple stakeholders that represent community members and decision policy makers, we're ensuring that the work that we're doing is not only usable, but is used. Um, <clears throat> there is multiple supporting evidence uh, to behind this idea. Uh, we already have seen that high uh, impact hazards can be clustered together in space of time, and we also have seen multiple hazards that result from a single event. Um, this is a new and emerging area of research. Um, we also have seen that uh, impacts from coastal hazards have both immediate as well as persist persistent impacts on the communities and ecosystems, and this area is uh, uh, still uh, not well understood. And finally, uh, there is a lack of uh, consideration of multiple hazards and uh, cascading, uh, risk, cas cascading impacts in uh, disaster preparation and response, which could uh, lead to less effective um, efforts by the local uh, operational community and long-term decreased community resilience. This is it, thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa Moulton at the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington, and I'm representing the group who discussed the concepts uh, of a coasts and people storm resilience test bed. The rest of the teams listed here, and I wanted to point out that we had a large group with a broad range of specialties, perspectives, and geographies. In a way, this discussion was a test bed of the test bed in terms of the challenges and benefits of a multi multidisciplinary group. Here I'll present a sampling of our ideas. 
one thing that drew this group together is the idea that while coastlines and coastal communities are affected in a range of ways and on a range of timescales, large storms are a huge part of this story and warrant a targeted focus. We lack a fundamental understanding of how coastal storms drive physical, biological, and social processes that threaten coastal communities, and in particular, how the environmental and social elements interact. The overall goal is to identify pathways to greater coastal resilience, and the approach is to bring physical ecosystem and social scientists together with local stakeholders in several centers to learn from past storm events, perform intensive rapid response studies of upcoming storms, and develop a framework for simulating future storm event scenarios to guide community action. Some specific recommendations we discussed. First, this could be housed in several geographic centers, which could be positioned to access different types of communities, coastline types, and storm characteristics. They could be located in public-private um, academic spaces to draw various researchers and partners together to co-produce knowledge and disseminate results. On the other hand, we thought that physical centers could bias resources to particular regions and also require more funding than non-physical centers that could be centered around themes. Uh, each center within the testbed would go to work gathering historical, environmental, and social data for past storms in selected regions. Next, one of the core components of the testbed would be to collect intensive social, physical, ecological data during large storm events. Though there are many challenges to achieve this, uh, we think these data sets would be really new and of high value. Uh, the test beds would then analyze physical, ecological, and socioeconomic outcomes of a coastal storm event for various environmental conditions and management decisions. And all this information would be leveraged to develop a simulation framework to assess storm-driven coastal hazards um, and human decision scenarios, which would guide future decision-making to improve coastal resilience. There's also a huge communication element here um, to use this information to prepare communities for the next storm event. One of the reasons we think this would be valuable is that we could understand why some coastal areas recover more quickly than others as a function of coastline type, population density, and management plans. The community engaged research methods would ensure that folks on the ground who can actually make changes like the Department of Transportation and emergency evacu evacuation managers are linked into the research process and can act on the latest evidence. Um, a major outcome would be a repository of biophysical and socioeconomic data, including during large events, along with a framework to assess storm-driven hazards and decision scenarios under different management decisions and environmental factors like storm intensity or sea level rise. To finish up, um, some other support for this approach is that it has the potential to make a big impact on underserved areas. Um, there's a broad consensus that our current ability to forecast physical, ecological, and societal aspects of coastal storms is poor, so this is a hugely important question. Um, combining interdisciplinary research approaches and local community knowledge would be a new approach to studying coastal storms and has the potential to be transformative. Uh, and finally, the testbed would facilitate structured decision making, which integrates science and policy uh, and has been shown to lead to better natural resource management outcomes. Thanks. All right, so I am uh, John Hathaway, and um, on behalf of John Goodall, Tori Tomacek, and Allison Riley, um, and I'm going to talk about green infrastructure for coastal resilience. Um, and it, it's not a topic that's, uh, um, or it is a topic that could be could be kind of input into into a hub or serve as a as a hub itself. And um, You'll notice our little uh, video conference selfie down here on the bottom that we uh, that we added. Um, so our idea in a nutshell is that coastal communities have unique stresses. Um, so we have sea level rise, climate change, extreme events, and all those things are 
are happening in a really unique environment where we have high water tables, we have specific types of soils. Um, and so this kind of gives us an opportunity to, um, to use this as a, as a test bed. Um, and what we want to do is engage um, a, a, a broad array of people. Um, what we see with green infrastructure is that it is a very communal um, issue. And so there are, because it has an aesthetic function and it has a, um, an engineering function and it has an ecological function, um, it really is something that a lot of people have to be at the table to talk about, um, in particular at the community scale. Um, it's very important to, um, to understand how the community embraces um, technologies like this. So what we envision is, um, is one or more urban communities that we, we basically use and a diversity of locations. So different densities, different ecologic conditions and different socioeconomics and use those basically as a, as a test bed. Um, we want to look at how to scale green infrastructure or how green infrastructure scales appropriately. Um, and that would be to reduce flooding, to improve well-being, and to improve um, livability. But we'll, I'll talk about the scale issue um, in just a second. So an idea would be to take the, a neighborhood or a watershed in, in a city that's frequently impacted and basically use that um, as, um, as a place for us to work. Now over here on the right, you can see a couple different examples of um, our engagement activities that, um, that can easily be kind of pulled into um, the work that we're talking about. So when we say green infrastructure, we basically mean two things. We mean some types of green infrastructure are constructed or, or uh, made or built into the environment, builds infrastructure essentially that's taking on these natural treatment functions. And there's others that's natural. So we have wetlands, we have mangroves, we have areas like that that feed into this greater network of green infrastructure. So really what we would like to do is target both of those two things to understand kind of the whole system. So we want to improve our understanding of green infrastructure. Um, and um, we want to basically look at ways to improve our designs and to improve our models as to how they actually work and, and how they work at these various scales. And opening the black box. So a lot of the systems that we use, we don't, we don't know exactly how they're working in terms of microbial communities, of, of um, physical um, uh, processes inside the system. And through this, we're going to be able to, to target communities and also engage with communities that are not well represented. So, for instance, there's literature that shows that disadvantaged communities are typically underserved by green infrastructure implementation programs. And so kind of understanding that social factor, why does that happen and what can we do to, um, to address those things? Um, and this goes back to the scale issue, which is kind of one of the frameworks that we, that we built on. Um, it's interesting that we understand uh, well how, how stormwater infrastructure works at the small scale, but not at the large scale. So there haven't been a lot of studies where we take a lot of practices and combine them in one watershed. And then the opposite is true for these larger kind of natural systems that we know how they work at the large scale, but we don't necessarily know how they work at more of a community scale. So what we want to do is couple these two things and try to study things at the community level, which is really the scale um, that we need to, to uh, bring resilience to, um, to these uh, coastal areas. Thank you. John, if you want to click leave breakout room and he'll take you back. Okay. And give it give it two seconds and then away you go. Good afternoon. My name is Alejandra Ortiz and I'm an assistant professor at North Carolina State University. Along with several colleagues, we came up with our suggestion for coastal hubs called co-hubs where the importance and focus is really trying to bridge temporal scales and looking at intersections of coastal and human understanding. So 
one of the key problems that we see is that a lot of times we'll have a single event, extreme event, like a hurricane, cause major damage. In response to that, management decisions and actions will be taken to deal with the short-term issue. This, however, can cause long-term impacts. An example here is if Barrier Island, trying to protect the coast from the flood of a hurricane, can actually hasten long-term erosion of that shoreline. And one of the things we're interested in looking at are the feedbacks among these temporal scales of the short and long term across the physical, ecological, social processes, all of which are interacting to determine the long term coastal evolution. And this requires convergence of different scientists, researchers, engineers, designers, artists, as well as stakeholders, local governments, dealing with housing authorities, practitioners, and educators. So our idea in a nutshell is to create a co-hub that focuses on episodic event-driven coastal hazards and looking at the impacts and feedbacks between beliefs, risk perceptions, and management decisions and how that then alters both the short and long-term evolution of coupled natural human systems. In particular, we want to emphasize co-learning, co-producing, and communicating between these different groups to develop equitable and sustainable coastal futures. One of the things we see of particular note is that we want to address non-linearities across spatial and temporal scales, identifying feedbacks and tipping points that may happen on the short scale that then drive long-term evolution. So we have some specific recommendations. Our first dealt with in our name, Cohubs, is trying to bridge the time scales between both the short and long-term events and create a convergent approach to look at this. By using co-learning, co-production, for example, internships or focus groups or visualizations, we can have innovative approaches that would include both arts and storytelling and not just the traditional methods. We suggest using a regional hub focused on a particular type of coastal setting. For example, out here in the east coast of North Carolina, barrier islands or coastal plain. Our hub would have a nested approach looking at three different spatial scales and dealing with feedbacks both on the small local community to across several communities. As a general recommendation, we think it's important to have an incubation phase or planning phase for these hubs. And finally, what we seek to deliver with this is cutting edge science that gives direct and positive impacts on the residents and creating models that can be adapted for use elsewhere, where the models are really focused on understanding the underlying processes driving the evolution of the coast and using this to see how science can inform decision-making and feed back into long-term coastal sustainability. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Laura and my gr group approached this by identifying areas that could be improved upon with the typical academic research structure and came up with an organizational and funding structure for co-hubs that would support improvement in these areas. The three areas we focus on are one, the difficulty of interdisciplinary work in terms of finding collaborators and sources of funding, two, the difficulty of finding support for applied research that produces tangible, usable products for a community or stakeholder, and three, the difficulty of engaging with communities and stakeholders throughout the process of a research project instead of as an afterthought. To address these issues, we envisioned large uh, regional physical hubs with their own core staff who can assist with applications, grant writing, and workshop planning. To facilitate interdisciplinary and geographically diverse interactions, we also envisioned topical virtual hubs, online communities of researchers and stakeholders focused around a specific topic of interest. We imagine the virtual hubs will contain a voluntary searchable database of expertise to help researchers identify potential collaborators and for stakeholders to directly contact experts for advice. The hubs could also fund workshops that would bring together diverse expertise surrounding a relevant issue. 
We would encourage the production of usable products for stakeholders by directly funding community-driven research projects. Communities and stakeholders would initiate and propose projects. They would apply to their regional hub with a problem uh, they would like to help addressing with research-based solutions. Proposed projects would be selected by a board from the regional hub, and then recommendations for funding would be kicked up to NSF. Descriptions of the community-based projects, ultimately earmarked for funding, would then be distributed and advertised throughout the hub system. At this stage, research groups would bid for the funding by proposing a budgeted research project to address the stakeholder problem. Built into the application process would be two expectations. The research team would be interdisciplinary, and secondly, the research propo proposed will produce a tangible, usable product for the stakeholder. Meetings between the research team and stakeholders would be facilitated throughout the timeline of the research project by the regional hub. For an example, a community experiencing storm surge flooding may apply for help determining the most effective strategies to mitigate this hazard. A team of engineers, sea level rise modelers, and economists could win the bid to address the problem by modeling different coastal engineering projects for different sea level rise scenarios. The product produced would be mapped to projected storm surge flooding given different engineering choices and a cost-benefit summary of the different strategies. The final stage in such a research project would be for the regional hubs to help the stakeholder determine the best way forward and help with any subsequent grant writing, workshops, or community initiatives that would help start making progress in the problem originally identified. The approaches proposed here are similar to those employed in other successful programs. The regional and virtual hubs, combined with a focus on community-driven projects, would enable more effective and useful collaborations between coastal scientists and stakeholders. Thank you. I'll look good. Yep. Oh, how will I know when I'm on? Uh, that's it, you're on. Okay, everyone. Uh, happy Friday afternoon. Um, I guess one of the benefits of going later is that a lot of great ideas similar to what we'll be sharing um, have already been put up. Um, so first I wanna thank our, our excellent team who brought these ideas together. Um, and all of us are, are listed there um, uh, on the title slide. So uh, leading with the title, um, a multi-level networked knowledge action hub for thriving coastal communities. So what, what's tied up in, in all of that? Um, well, our recommendations, I guess, are structured around two main ideas um, that could be incorporated to any number of different hub-type structures. Um, but I guess the, the key uh, attribute that we envision for hubs is that they're multi-leveled, um, whereby the main hubs serve not only to connect other hubs, um, but perhaps more critically that they serve local coastal communities. Um, which then operate as an array of subnodes um, and can involve many different sites and populations. Um, which brings us to the second key attribute of, of the hubs that we were envisioning, um, which that it engages local stakeholders at all phases of the research. So our goal is that this coupled scientist community-based research supports the development of a co-produced knowledge system um, and that this co-production of ideas, data, and knowledge is a central attribute of, of the hub design. Um, our context for this is that arriving at 
sustainable and thriving coastal communities and the coastal systems that support them are among the primary goals of uh, amidst ongoing uh, coastal environmental change. And uh, as, as many speakers have, have noted, it's this coupling of the human and natural systems that remains one of the grand challenges in, in coastal research, um, with people serving as both stakeholders um, and agents of change uh, to the physical environment, both, both good and uh, bad. So uh, we envision a hub design uh, designed to tackle these challenges. So, there we go. Um, so our idea in a nutshell um, is that coastal communities are the key stakeholders, um, that they hold a rich knowledge of lived experiences and uh, are the key agents uh, in coastal systems. Um, so we envision an action-oriented hub, um, one that seeks uh, actionable research, um, integrating local knowledge into its fundamental framework, um, and that the output is uh, this co-produced transdisciplinary uh, coastal research. Um, on the guiding research question, um, I think the, the gist of it is that um, we want to test to what extent these co-produced visions, strategies, and solutions can serve as intervention or, or leverage points. Um, and let's see, my notes go. Uh, with the idea that we, the hypothesis, the, the goal is that co-produced coastal research is going to yield new findings and hold a legitimacy with the public that will better enable strong science-based recommendations to be carried forward more effectively rather than it being strictly science-driven um, and detached from the human coastal communities. So um, with that, uh, the co-produced knowledge system would uh, have three phases of engaging people at the outset of defining the research questions, going to an iterative evaluation and learning phase, um, and designing the experiments, interpretation action, and circling back, back around. So um, I will leave it there, um, as I'm sure that's at least three minutes, and uh, we can move on. So thanks very much. Okay, I'm Julia Wellner, and I am presenting alone right now, but the presentation benefited from discussions with many other uh, conference participants earlier in the week. The hub I would like to propose would be focused on the rate of sea level change and the ability of different coasts to respond to those rates. Sea level predictions typically focus on the total amount of sea level rise that will take place by 2100 or some other fixed year in the future. And while there's a great deal of ambiguity about those models and how much the ultimate sea level rise might be, there's not a lot of focus on the immediate changes that are expected in the next few decades. And what this means is that the scale of sea level rise predictions doesn't match the scale of coastal planning. So this hub would be focused on the, answering the questions of what are the predicted rates of change over the next couple of decades and which coasts or coastal infrastructures can keep up with that rate and which cannot. So specifically, this hub would integrate scientists, planners, modelers, biologists, and social scientists who are focused on various aspects of coastal resiliency and integrate them with sea level change modelers to develop some specific sets of information. First set would include an understanding of what sea level change is predicted over the next few decades and what are the local variabilities in that? What rate will sea level change in what place? And importantly, what are the uncertainties that go with those predictions? Second theme to be addressed by this group 
is what are the rates of sea level change that would overwhelm different shorelines and what types of infrastructure versus what rates are manageable? Because different shorelines will be able to handle different changes and we don't always know what the threshold rate is. Third, what are the questions that coastal scientists still have about sea level change? What do communities want to know? And if there's a chance that sea level predictions could answer that but haven't yet, could they be inspired by hearing these questions for future work? The next slide just stalled out. Um, there we no, go. Okay, okay you, you're good. Okay, so uh, what is the value? The value is to get modeling focused on the information that is specifically needed. Um, so sea level doesn't change evenly. That applies to both rates and location. And so specific flood prediction models for the future need to know what local sea level rise will be doing. And so the question then for modeling is what is the threshold sea level rise rate that any shoreline can survive? And how does that compare to predicted rates? So we want to bring global long-term sea level rise models, downscale them to the decade scale and specific to given locations. Um, the purpose of this and the evidence is that we know sea level rise rates have changed throughout the past. We know that some shorelines can withstand um, sudden pulses of sea level rise and some shorelines cannot. If we're going to prepare for coastal resiliency, which will almost certainly be an expensive prospect, let's make sure we're preparing for the right rate. Otherwise, it is simply um, a wasted endeavor. Thank you. We are group 28, uh, and we were a very multidisciplinary bunch, uh, which we really enjoyed uh, working together. Uh, and our idea is really centered around how do communities uh, identify and define uh, what the problems, the challenges that they face are, and then how do they identify and use scientific research to address those challenges. And so what we came up with is more of an approach or a process or a structure rather than a specific research idea. And it's really based around this life cycle approach with four stages. Uh, identification of those different issues that are facing uh, coastal areas, but also those issues that researchers have identified uh, as being worthy of, of interest. Uh, connecting then those researchers with those communities, uh, implementing the scientific research and, and any recommendations that come out of that research, and then evaluating and sharing not just the results, uh, whether those recommendations worked or not, but also the process that was put in place. For our specific recommendations under identification, uh, you know, you have researchers identifying where there are knowledge gaps, uh, where they would like to move their own research into coastal issues, uh, but then you also have communities identifying their own needs locally uh, and the challenges they face. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the hub could be there to identify whatever is missing between those two things and ensuring broader participation uh, and a more diverse array of perspectives rather than just the same communities and the same researchers always participating. Um, and really the core of our idea uh, is based on say a dating app uh, that connects individuals based on their shared interests. Uh, so our idea was to, to implement that same kind of matching process between researchers uh, and communities based on their shared interests, their shared understanding of, of what challenges are out there. Uh, and so the hub would facilitate communication between those participants and other groups um, green light those projects that they think are worthy of moving ahead. Uh, the participants uh, in those projects would then use structured decision making uh, to analyze and address their problems. Uh, and for those communities that may lack 
the resources needed to implement some of those scientific recommendations, the hub would be there to connect them to those resources, either within government or externally. Uh, and then for evaluation, right, not, again, not just evaluating whether those recommendations worked, but also, you know, the use of science and having access to those scientific recommendations. Did that change the way that these communities understood uh, the problem? Uh, who is participating, right, also subject to evaluation. And then building this library of successful case studies to guide future projects and let the hub adapt and learn and grow over time. Uh, we really see a lot of different value to this idea on the research side, uh, obviously identifying future needs and future areas of research based on uh, what the communities uh, think as and how they define the problem and what they see as worthy of, of research. Uh, but then also, again, additional kind of second order research into whether participation in this process influences the role of decision making and problem definition in these communities. And for the communities, right, they gain research evidence based information, they gain assistance finding resources. Um, and we really see a lot of different stakeholders and partners being part of this process. So why this idea now? Um, again, it's based on this idea that different communities may have different understandings, uh, different ways of defining uh, the challenges that they face. And so it's making connections between those different understandings and connecting the way that communities are defining the, the challenges to the way that scientists and researchers are defining those challenges. Um, and we really want to emphasize that this is a sort of an adaptive approach uh, where the hub and, and those involved can modify and share lessons learned and, and not necessarily just adhere to what worked last time must work next time, but really change based on the, the, the adaptive needs of those participating. So thank you. Hi, I'm Twyla Moon, and I'm presenting an idea developed with Anna Braswell and Rao Kodamarti. Our idea it addresses having the structure and the methodology of the hub, so it doesn't apply as much to the theme or the research question, which could be more flexible and apply to the whole hub or to annual um, research proposal calls. It's an innovation hub and it's a research and technology incubator. And incubator might bring to mind startup or tech incubators, and that's where we're really getting much of our inspiration from. So our um, incubator is gonna link innovators across all of those broadening participation groups, um, academia, nonprofits, agencies, community stakeholders. And our programs are gonna emphasize participation of next generation and early career folks so that they're getting training and facilitated and interactions that are gonna last throughout their career and teach them about relationship building, help to build those relationships and teach them how to create and successfully um, bring to fruition community-driven research. The structure here will have funding so that leaders and participants from all of these different groups that you see on the left can participate. Um, and the program elements will include a training program that is a one-year training program and can be offered every year that the hub exists. It's facilitated, it's gonna focus on design thinking, how to create and work with diverse groups. And people who have completed that training program are then eligible to apply for competitive research grants. And those research grants have to apply the training element. So they have to provide research questions that are co-produced um, by scientists and stakeholders and that um, involve all those different members of the community. We'll also have annual participation events so that people can connect across years and we'll connect to tech innovators and incubators as another way of being able to connect to science, um, new technology like sensors, different ways of um, working with data or different data sources like you might see from Google or Facebook and um, also potentially different funding sources. 
we think this is a really key, um, both to have the training and then the long term, the longer term research projects. It creates a program legacy by uh, focusing on early career folks, and also through the curriculum curriculum that we'll build that can be applied within this hub and elsewhere. We also think it's really important that this kind of model creates an innovative and entrepreneurial environment that we think is really attractive to young people today and to bring in other creative professionals and community members um, so that all of those people are getting the training that's needed to understand how to work in diverse groups and how to co-produce research knowledge um, and then produce actionable deliverables. One of the things we think is really important about doing this now is that it provides an agile, responsive model. So by having um, this training program, every year that training might um, learn from previous years um, and how it's um, provided. And the research questions that are created can be responsive to the different group communities, uh, as well as the location and the timing of it. And then what comes out of it is that we're funding the best, most innovative ideas that come from participants. So we have multiple streams of um, legacy and, and research that's coming from it. We'll validate the program by looking at engagement from the community, from participants, from the public at large, and we'll use standard science metrics as well as individual metrics um, that are developed for each of the funded research projects. And we'll also um, have people who can help support the, all of the participants and those who are funded later on in producing usable deliverables, and we'll look at how well those are used. And they might run from apps to policy briefs to data sets, et cetera. The Stanford Design School and DARPA and Y Combinator were all organizations that we thought of in the inspiration for how to create these hub structure. And that's it. Thank you guys so much. Okay, we have uh, two more uh, pre-recorded um, sessions for you now, uh, and I'm going to play those uh, back to back. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Chevinato, and I am with the California Sea Grant Program. I'm proud to present on behalf of Group 32 our recommendation for regional collaboratives to harness the resources of academic institutions, NGOs, and government agencies to help our coastal and Great Lakes communities build and maintain resilience. In a nutshell, our recommendation for regional collaboratives is to integrate use inspired research, extension, science communications, and education with the community around them. These collaboratives will identify information gaps and barriers, facilitate co-production of knowledge, develop and interpret data sets at an appropriate scale for decision making, encourage implementation of mitigation and adaptation plans, and provide decision support. The mission of these collaboratives would be to partner with coastal and Great Lakes communities and other stakeholder groups in their regions to identify problems and community goals for addressing mission using a three-tiered approach. A pilot program first to inform the structure of these collaboratives and define the scales at which they would work. Then, once the structure and approach are defined, regional collaboratives could be established to conduct place-based research defined through co-production given the location, community, coastal processes, hazards, challenges, and opportunities. A hallmark of these regional collaboratives would be to partner across institutions, agencies, and communities to build long-term relationships and trust and invest in underrepresented communities by further developing models of engagement and inclusion. The third tier is a national coordinating body to coordinate research, infrastructure, and engagement so knowledge and lessons learned can be applied across collaboratives. Some example research questions are group discussed, 
centered around understanding systems and understanding processes. An example of a question under understanding systems is what are the implications of multiple cascading hazards on coastal ecosystems and communities? How would that affect future resilience? And under understanding processes, how does cooperation between multiple coastal stakeholders in defining science problems impact our understanding of and approach to performing basic science? The value of these regional collaboratives is that they will facilitate science-based decisions about coastal management, resources, and future generations. And as a result, communities will be better prepared for both cascading hazards and individual pulsed hazards. And science will be improved by grounding questions and ideas in community needs. To end with why our group strongly believes in this way forward is that it builds upon the wealth of networks and resources that already exist, such as Sea Grant and the NOAA RESA programs, instead of creating new entities that would duplicate effort. By using existing models that have demonstrated success, regional collaboratives will be poised to hit the ground running directly with coastal and Great Lakes communities and help them use science to make short-term and long-term decisions that will enable them to better prepare for and recover from hazards. Thank you. Our title is a socio-ecological systems approach to coasts and people convergence research by Paul Hinesley, Rick Ludick, Donna Marie Bilkovic, and Peter Ruggiero. Given that humans are both an agent of change to coastal landscapes and also the intended target of protection and sustainability, then the coupling of, human, of coastal human natural systems becomes a grand challenge for the science community. This hub should be organized between the social, natural, engineered, and business spheres, acknowledging existing interactions between these spheres. We recommend uh, that a COPE hub is impact-driven, problem-based, grounded in well-defined research objectives, addresses the dynamic nature within the system, and is convergent focus, facilitating transdisciplinary and stakeholder interaction. In use of the socio-ecological system as an essential organizing feature, the COPE hub would employ concepts of ecosystem services and co-benefits as a means for solving multifaceted problems. It involves multiple representative settings and develops scalable data, tools, and approaches that optimize decision-making. The hub should facilitate the interaction of social and physical scientists to cultivate new innovative coastal science and provide cross-training for integrative transdisciplinary researchers and practitioners. It is impact-driven, requiring identification of impacted stakeholders across all four spheres and facilitate the creation of knowledge products that are specifically targeted for adaptive science-based decision-making. It should be problem-based with goals that can be scalable from local to regional to global context. It should be convergent focus requiring diverse groups to interact. The socio-ecological system approach focuses on interactions between natural systems, targeted resources in the system, users of the resources, and governance of that usage, and the factors influencing sustainability or resiliency. Moreover, it is iterative and adaptable. Success will be measured by saving property, lives, and money, helping decision makers with complex problem solving, developing tools that are scalable, advancing predictive modeling for socio-ecological systems and broadening participation across spheres.
Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah Wise, and I'm a cultural anthropologist with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. I'm representing group 34 to talk about the idea of creating transformative knowledge. For thousands of years, all societies have communicated through narratives and through their art. This hub idea is about developing new forms of creating, interpreting, and using communication through narratives, storytelling, and art. This is more than just science communication. This is about transforming science as we know it. So the idea is that of co-production and co-convenience of knowledges. We want to establish a bridging institution, a hub with boundary-spanning personnel who speak to multiple knowledges and paradigms of understanding coastal challenges. This hub will bridge knowledges to transform both conventional and traditional perspectives and create new insights using proven methods and platforms of knowledge integration. Our recommendation is that by establishing a bridging institution, we can bring together Western science with other epistemologies to study what methods of co-production and conveyance are most effective in place-based different communities. To convert peer-reviewed science into stories, art, and music, to transform the practice of scientific research, and to equip marginalized communities to interact in conventional scientific forums, as well as equipping conventional scientists to be more able to interact with these communities. Some methods in which we can use to do this is empathy-driven storytelling, co-creation of art, and science fiction prototyping. The value of this is to develop new knowledges, thorough translations, and transformation. There'll be a convergence of research that tackles complex problems focusing on societal needs the emergence of new articulations of coastal communities, knowledges, fears, hopes, and ideas. It will be a place of multi-directional learning that will transform understanding and develop fundamental work that leverages new partners, strengthens resources, and generates new ideas. So where we are now is in a state of stagnation Knowledge co-production yields significant benefits, but remains underused and understudied. Stories can serve as empathy engines that connect personal and collective experiences to address coastal challenges. More of the same cannot address wicked problems faced by community members and coastal communities. To do, to do that, we need a radically different approach. In sum, this hub is about rethinking knowledge production beyond basic research to generate and share multiple knowledges to better support and inform and apply coastal socio-ecological resilience. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. My name is Reed Nichols, and I'm uh, glad to be here. And I really want to thank the planners and the facilitators who made this uh, amazing uh, workshop possible, especially the virtual uh, segment. Today, I'm really going to talk about the structure and uh, possibly the context for a transdisciplinary uh, project. In a nutshell, I think a sequential research program should be envisioned, one that allows uh, the identification of uh, key stakeholders. Uh, they could be internal to a funded project and external uh, participants. And uh, the focus should be reducing risks for vulnerable populations. The uh, project should advance the contributions of physical and social scientists, and it could benefit groups from citizen data scientists uh, to local, state, federal governments. So this would be a fairly unique uh, project, not your basic uh, research project of the past. Uh, this, this possibly could deliver uh, or transition uh, new technologies to benefit people. Uh, a limited objective experiment might be a, a place to start, one that allows the integration of environmental engineering and community resilience. Key to uh, doing this is not only looking at skill assessments or measurements of performance, but also to look at the utility or the effectiveness of products that are going to be used by decision makers or the community. And those um, should be qualitative and quantitative. One of the uh, aspects that would probably uh, uh, differentiate this from uh, other projects is having a collaboration uh, leaders uh, somehow involved to help integrate government, industry, and university participants. By doing this, a larger audience could be engaged. This, this should happen uh, from uh, the very beginning in identifying stakeholders, maybe putting together a, some sort of stakehold, stakeholder register and then uh, affecting a, a limited objective experiment that would help develop deep integrated knowledge. And then scientific papers, as well as uh, some sort of demonstration should be able to substantiate the value of the research to support co-production by operational organizations, uh, even uh, citizen scientists in their homes. So how do you integrate natural and social sciences, I think that you have to have a structure that includes some sort of uh, collaboration leaders that help uh, the social scientists, the physical scientists, and those in the community uh, to, to include industry are able to work in a common context. That sometimes uh, doesn't happen, and um, I'm sure everybody wants that to happen, and the, the collaboration leadership should would be uh, essential, which might be a third-party uh, group to a research project. Essential to that is planning a demonstration that allows you to um, support decision makers or let them see how they're, they're being supported. And then to determine if we are able to better prepare, resist, recover, and adapt to achieve functional performance. So in the past, we've seen that partnership projects have, have really resulted in technological advances. So let's apply a partnership project to enhance coastal resilience. Let's use existing infrastructure that we, we all have know about, uh, whether it's uh, long-term ecological research, uh, integrated ocean observing systems, physical oceanographic real-time systems. Let's exploit that data and, um, and then fill the gaps with mobile survivable sensors to measure uh, the extremes that are occurring during uh, ha hazardous weather. Skill assessments are key, not only by uh, individual researchers, but by independent third parties. That pr produces reliability so that operators are more comfortable in using results from research. And also, this helps improve situational awareness for uh, people to, to, in fact, be a weather-ready nation. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody have a, uh, a great day.
Hey, Bernice, give us a couple of seconds and then you should be. Just watch the microphones right in front of your mouth there, Bernice, so we're just getting your uh, breathing at the moment. That's better. Perfect. Okay, when you're ready. Hi, my name is Bernice Rosenzweig, and I was really privileged to be able to work on Christina Hill, where we'd like to recommend New Zealand's hubs focused on coastal groundwater dynamics. So in a nutshell, groundwater is actually really key to understanding coastal systems, even though it's received really limited attention until recently. Um, with sea level rise, the changing dynamics of groundwater will have significant impacts on flooding, on human and ecosystem health, on liquefaction and seismic hazards, and on infrastructure function. So we feel that enhancing our understanding of coastal groundwater will be a grand challenge for researchers across disciplines and recommend that NSF supports a COPE hub or ideally several hubs that are focused on groundwater dynamics in coastal regions. Um, we specifically recommend that the hubs consider sea level rise, altered precipitation patterns, and human activities such as pumping in the way that they impact groundwater dynamics. Hubs that are based in with, on consortia of universities with closely integrated partnerships between practitioners and local nonprofits with an emphasis on co-generation of knowledge. Um, we think that the research of these hubs should focus on empirical data collection, integrated numerical modeling, process studies, and support research on novel strategies for adaptation. So this type of hub would have a lot of impact and value for society. Um, current efforts to model flood flooding and map vulnerability rarely include uh, groundwater processes and current explorations of physical adaptation in coastal landscapes, particularly in cities, don't take the dynamics of groundwater into consideration. Um, without including these dynamics, there are a lot of processes by which these adaptation strategies could fail. Um, and large coastal cities in particular, which have significant infrastructure that's located underground, are particularly vulnerable to changes in groundwater level. Um, land, sea, and groundwater interactions also play a really important role in coastal biogeochemical cycling, but these processes have been poorly studied and are rarely incorporated in ecosystem management. Um, our recommendation is based on recent studies that have been conducted throughout the United States in Honolulu, in Miami, Norfolk, New York City, San Francisco Bay Area, um, and beyond that, that indicate that groundwater processes are critical components of human-dominated socio-ecotechnical systems. And if you have a chance to check out a report, we actually provide a bibliography of all of those studies. Um, coastal groundwater research is inherently interdisciplinary, and it requires collaboration across research disciplines, agencies, and stakeholders. That's why we feel that there's an urgent need for research hubs to facilitate empirical data collection, process studies, and help these many groups of researchers and stakeholders understand uh, strategies for adaptation and conservation. Okay, all done, Bernice. Yeah, should I return to the main session? Yeah, if you want to go. Um, that's it. That wraps it up for the uh, the virtual team. Thank you ever so much to everybody who's uh, been involved in the last few days. Uh, we're going to sign off now and we'll see you in just over 30 minutes time, I think, for uh, San Diego.